This is the team from Bottle Rocket. Bottle Rocket is an experience design consultancy. We focus really heavily on creating the next generation of experiences. We have deep roots in mobile application development, but as most of you know, that world has exploded. And now, especially in a post-COVID environment, there are expectations that the experience from the very beginning of that first brand interaction through that entire customer life cycle is consistent, it provides valuable information that's helpful. It utilizes the right channels that allow someone to feel like they are being communicated to on a one-to-one -one basis. We brought a lot of folks here today from Bottle Rocket to talk just about that. So we really want to have a dialogue today about how do we optimize mobile growth in a post-COVID era? And mobile here is more than anything a proxy for one of the dominant channels for consumers' expectations in this environment. So with all that said, I'm Peter Klayman. I lead the business strategy group at Bottle Rocket. You can think of us as the folks who would come in early on to help advocate for why those investments in CapEx and OpEx make sense, how investing in digital experiences or a mixed digital physical experience won't prove things like competitive position, long-term brand um, attribution, as well as growth. Tim Duncan here is also part of the business strategy team and leads our growth practice. And so our growth practice at Bottle Rocket, more than anything, is focused on retention. We see retention as the number one lever, that if you can improve retention, you will see a lot higher ROI across all of your channels, and you'll see higher levels of engagement, you'll see higher levels of conversion on offers presented, and over time, those really retained users who are loyal to your brand will also drive acquisition through word of mouth, which even in a digital world, remains one of the dominant channels to drive growth. And then we also have Tony here, Tony Dos Doset. Tony is an experienced designer, deep background with a lot of things. We actually host a podcast together called Lift Off by Bottle Rocket. So if you want to hear a little bit more about us, that isn't why he has the mixer board and all of these awesome tools and this beautiful mic. That's for a variety of reasons. Tony's here because it's really important that at each step of the user journey, users feel like they're being communicated in a way that's consistent with your brand values, that helps them have a better understanding of how this actually moves forward their place in your brand and gets them to explore things and see more and craft journeys that make sense, that are robust, that are informed, and that are flexible. And we're seeing that more than ever now in a post-COVID world where that those who made substantive investments in having a strong digital footprint are able to leverage that footprint to do new and innovative things faster. Now that doesn't mean everybody can't catch up and we always know di digital is a game of catch up, but those first couple of months of early market, whether that was with Chipotle quickly adjusting their messaging when they rolled into a COVID era, knowing that they were gonna have a lot of their orders come off-prem instead of on-prem, or others like Chick-fil-A that were able to completely change their on-premises operations to adjust to higher drive-through volumes, higher app utilization rates, and a lot of customers who historically may not have been target digital customers. I cannot tell you how many times I have to walk my 60-year-old parents through an order flow in some form or fashion on a mobile app that you never expected them to use. And that's what we're seeing in the data as well. So, hey, that's a little bit of an intro. We've gone for about five minutes here. What we would really like to do is hear from you. Now, yes, we have some pre-created things we can talk about, but more than anything, we'd love to invite some of those folks who are in there watching this session into the queue to ask us some questions and, and we'll start. I'm gonna invite the first person in, we'll get going. And then if you have any questions, either feel free to hop in below and we'll add you to the moderation board or post that question in chat, we'll get going. Okay, first person in. I added the plus, let's see. Nope, okay. That was a bust. We're gonna try one more. Terry? These are all people who are open to join. We're not seeing many questions yet to invite someone in. No problem. We have some pre-prepared questions on our side too. So first one's for you, Tim. What are some of the largest trends that we're seeing as brands start to optimize for growth in that post-COVID era. Now, fully aware of the fact that COVID's still going on, it's going to change. There's a lot of manifestations as we move into the winter, but what did we see immediately after the pandemic started? 
versus now when we're in that six month mark, seven month mark, and things are actually starting to feel like a, a new normal in, in a sense. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, appreciate it, Peter. Um, so I think it's best to look at what brands did as a reflection of what customer shifts happened as a result of COVID-19. So if I'm looking back at like what happened with shifts in customer behavior before COVID-19 hit, I think like what I was reading is about 55% of food, 55% well, I mean, of people's money was being spent on food away from home. So there was a lot of eating out, a lot of dining out. When COVID-19 hit, you know, it shifted into a mode of where like about 80% of, of money was being spent on food at home and a very small percentage was being spent, you know, within the QSR space, for example. This is just one, one example. But as a result, you know, brands had to shift very hard into delivery and and curbside curbside pickup and so some of the things that i that i have seen in my personal experience um, as a result of working with brands as a result of that shift are things like i've seen brand i've seen teams within brands across marketing product and engineering start to work a lot closer with each other this collaboration in order to make sure that services are being delivered the correct way through that digital channel which was the only channel for a lot of businesses was critical. So I've seen a lot closer collaboration with the clients that I'm working with as a result of, of that shift. So number two here, every client that I talk to, um, every, every, every one of our customers wants to move faster, wants to be more agile, and wants to move with, with better quality in that delivery. You know, the, the COVID-19, had, COVID-19 has only accelerated the need to put a lot of these digital solutions in market. And so I've, I've definitely seen you know, that demand for, for moving faster and having more robust digital operations. And then finally, the one I'll, I'll put on, pick on is I've seen a big shift to brands focusing on first party data solutions. So like as a result of some of the things that you're seeing within advertising networks, the unique identifier, um, wanting to drive more personalized engagement in those solutions, investing in first party channels like SMS, for example, having a mobile app, having a web app, but having you know these these adjacent um, properties like mobile wallet, for example, gives you another touch point and first party data to personalize the experience. So those are the things that jump off to me that I've seen firsthand. Uh, Tony, have you seen anything that you'd pick out? Well, I think as far as from the user's lens and you know sort of a design centric um, aspect to this is <clears throat> expectations even before COVID were evolving and changing as the digital space has changed. But now with this COVID era, it has compounded and the, and the, the velocity at which our expectations are changing as users is astounding. And it's not a, Oh, they don't have it. Whatever. I'll just try again later. It's a, you don't have it. I'm not playing with you anymore. I'm going to a different playground. And that's that's one of the things is that that if if you aren't up to the task and ready, you're off the phone because that real estate is so vital and so important. I mean, I speak for myself when I'll download an app, I'll open it up. And if it doesn't immediately meet my needs, exceed them, surprise me, delight me, whatever it is, it's off the phone. And that's the world that we're in right now. It sure is. So I think for a lot of the folks that we have here in this panel, my assumption is you all have ideas of how to drive this type of growth that you seek. Likely, you're probably facing some issues around three core pillars, people, process, and technology. And we see those three as the three main elements to driving growth. Oftentimes, there's a lot of really good emphasis on having the right tech stack in place. And and, and just for a quick preview, We think product intelligence is one of the earliest investments you should make because it gives you a really strong understanding of what's happening on your platform. From there, there's a lot of different directions that you can go. I see Adrian just came up with a question. We'll hit your question up in just one second, Adrian. So what I would like to talk about for a second is some of us out there are trying to present new and innovative ways to drive growth to executive teams. Tony, I know that you and your experience have seen a lot greater risk tolerance from ELTs around trying new and innovative things. Can you give us one or two examples of that and how you navigated those conversations, maybe just to give everybody a little bit of a frame on how to move forward with those conversations at their organizations? Well, it's it's really interesting what we've been seeing where in the 
in the pre-COVID world, there's a lot more hesitation toward big ideas and toward investing a lot in those big ideas because with that, there's a lot of risk associated with it. However, the time that we're in now, it's kind of like, all right, everything's crazy. We got to do this. What do you got sort of thing? So if we can back it up with data, with qualitative, quantitative research and say, these are the big needle movers. This is the, this is the direction in which we need to innovate. We're seeing that they're game. People are game and they want to dive in. And frankly, they have to dive in. And the more that the more that we yep. can guide them in that with with the research, with the data, the better and the more solid it's going to be. And the faster we can get to market with something like that, we can iterate and test and make it better and better and better and better. We're not waiting an entire year anymore to drop something in the market and then cross your fingers. You know, it's a it's a really fast iterative process. Yeah, MVP has become a term that's actually embraced, not just said out loud, but yet we have an entire set of stories that we're going to take down for V1. So uh, we're seeing that play out too with clients on that side. So Adrian asked a great question about great examples of retention that you've seen lately from brands. One immediately comes to mind for me because they were hammered yesterday on the street for something that was really a retention play. And that that's Chipotle. Chipotle's profitability wasn't what they were expecting from an analyst side due to the shift to a third party delivery network and a majority of customers leveraging delivery. Now, in the long run, there are a lot of things that Chipotle can do to earn back that margin, whether they negotiate net new rates, using dispatch and other things, or they start to take core markets and build their own delivery capability because they know there's a volume there. The play and the reason they're willing to give up some of that profitability is it's more important to have an order coming through that platform that keeps Chipotle front of mind, that keeps it as your day-to-day -day dining, than it is necessarily to drive the profitability of that transaction. Now, I know this is a scary game to play because there's only so far you can play it. And we're not in the food delivery wards here all the time. However, as you're meeting customers' expectations around retention, one of the main plays is making sure you can offer them the services that they want in a way that's most conducive to the way they want to get it. And in this situation, Chipotle made that investment and did go to the street and got a little bit of blowback for it. But in the long run, it will keep them in a really strong competitive position. Uh, Tim, Tony, any other examples you're seeing of great retention plays? You're on mute, Tim. And you're on mute, Tim. Guys, so the one the one that I'm going to point out here is, you know, one of our one of our previous clients that I'm seeing in the market that is that is really has a really strong experience and is growing. Is going to be MoneyGram. Um, I see a lot of reports on their LinkedIn profiles. This is the one that just comes to mind. But I know one of the things that I've I've seen in their brand was that you know 50% of customers who make a first time transaction come back and make a second transaction. Now in a commerce based brand where people are going into physical locations, retention is much harder to drive at that like 75% level on a 30 day uh, retention curve than it is for a digital first company like a Facebook or a Twitter. I've seen retention curves with Facebook and Twitter that are like 90% on a 30 day basis. That's really difficult in a commerce based business, which is really the lifeblood of Bottle Rocket. We work with a lot of brands that have physical footprints. So driving 50% or even higher is that's incredible for me. Tony, anything you want to add to that or we Let's can go to the, the next, next one. one. Okay, next one is what major shifts have you seen in older industries like banking? Let me start with saying early in the pandemic, we started to see some incredible numbers about first time digital user growth. So the biggest shift we're seeing in those traditional industries is for a very long time, there has been this notion that different segments will engage in different ways. And so yes, most banks out there had a mobile application or a, a digital banking web portal. However, some of their older customers still went to branches, still went and talked to people, still deposited checks, not via scan and deposit. What we're seeing is we're seeing a huge tidal wave at every age level, at every segment, moving into that digital experience and not just using it once, but using it a few times. So I think if there were one thing I would focus on if I was in a more traditional industry, it is find those users 
that are net new to your digital experiences that are doing things that users for a very long time have already been doing. And I'll give you an example with me, sample size of one. I've been a, a mobile banking customer for five years. You know what my on-platform behavior is. You know what features I utilize. You know how I define success and you know my frequency of utilization. You don't have that data for those net new 50 to 65 year olds, 65 plus who are coming on your platform for the very first time. So use adjacent user theory to actually go through and try to drive behavior modifications with those net new users so that they do start getting into a habitual use cycle. Even traditional industries, and we see this across the board, are having to do two major things. One, reset executive expectations around continual investment from both a CapEx and an OpEx side when it comes to digital. This isn't app, this isn't web, this is teams that support the capability to do business digitally. The second major shift that we're seeing is don't be stuck to the past. You might have to change your major sources of revenue. You might have to change the corporate relationships that you form. It's easier said than done. And I realize what a seismic shift we're talking about here. But if you used to run live events and you're now in a digital environment, here we are in Hopin on mobile on air is a really great example. You might have to move from awareness oriented sponsors to those who actually have the ability to move all the way through to a conversion on these types of events. It's one very minute example, but keep in mind that that shift is occurring in every different industry. Any other stuff you wanna to add to that from um, Tony with regard to major shifts you see in older industries? And I think there's a lot of older industries you work yeah. in every day. One of the interesting aspects about legacy industries is that a lot of times they rest on the laurels of the power of that legacy. And what we're seeing is that those days are numbered. They really are. And uh, it actually goes really well into Scott Singerman's question about you know driving organizational alignment between product and marketing teams. But we'll get to that right after. I, I remember um, when, I was a, when I was a kid, uh, a short story here in Beeville, Texas, a southeast town, very small. My grandfather and, uh, would take us to the bank. And it was like a social moment. It was, it was a, hey, how you doing? Everybody knew everyone. There were donuts. There was coffee. It was like a lounge situation. And you've seen some banks like Capital One try to create experiences inside the brick and mortar banks to, to sort of be that moment again. But from my perspective and from a lot of the data, it's not really pushing the needle that forward. Like Peter said, he's been a digital banker for five years. I can't speak for Tim, but myself included, I don't know when the last time I stepped foot in a bank was. And when the experiences are dead simple, and even with those older demographics, you know, how many times have a parent or a loved one said, how do I do this? How do I you know, make a deposit? Once they're taught once, and it is dead simple, which it has to be dead simple, they're in. They're good. They're good to go. So you, you have to look the legacy in the face and say, it's time to change because everyone around us is changing. And that's how I see it. And Yeah, I, I think that I also want to add one more thing to this too. We've talked a lot about banking, but it's not only banking. Yeah. So we have some heavy industry clients who are thinking about applications of digital technology to drive use cases that are focused on cost savings, not around the customer side. The one point of caution that I would give to everybody about this is start small, find a really easy, quick win that doesn't require an ecosystem development, doesn't require a huge lift and a six or 12 month roadmap. Prove out that even in that really tiny use case, it's a better experience for employees. It reduces operational costs, gives increased visibility to your clients in whatever industry that's within and expand from there. So, you know, we used to see these big digital transformation projects that were brought from the major consultancies that had 
36 different phases, each of which would be the other. And they just really didn't work. We saw like, what, 15, 16, 17% success rates for those massive programs. Do not try to make the same mistakes again. If you're going to go after trying to drive change in a legacy industry, start really narrow, build out from there, build those bridges, and don't be that one person army. Build those bridges to see everybody's role. The hardest part here is you're going to have a lot of roles that are displaced or changed. If you get those folks in those organizations, whether that's product or marketing, and this leads in really good to this next question that Scott posted, alignment is so important but it's oftentimes hard to see the forest through the trees. Give everybody that one little bit that they can say, we drove success on this. And forget about the wins that are attributed to you. The best win that you could ever attribute is you have a great idea and a bunch of other people talk about how their idea did so much change. That's the best situation in a digital change environment. Get those other folks advocating for additional change on your behalf. Grow your percentage of the organization that's embracing that new way of working demonstrate to executive leadership metrics that matter that are actually attributable to something like revenue, even though we all know it's a lagging indicator and shouldn't be the thing that you put as your main goal, but translate it to the ELT so they can understand why they're continually investing in this and go from there. I think I want to add to that really quickly. Um, you know, as, yeah, as a designer it, myself, we always speak a lot about, you know, empathizing with the user and, and, really that is our that is our call to action and that that is the flag that we shove into the mountain which is empathy but you have to have the same empathy for the organization you know it there's a lot of big change happening and if you can't seek to understand before being understood everyone loses so you have to have empathy for the user empathy for the product team marketing team organization and empathy for their legacy and how it's evolving and how it's going to continue to evolve. I just wanted to uh, say that. That's great. Tim, do you want to add a little bit of how we as consultants approach gaining alignment between product marketing? And I would put IT in the mix there as well, as well as the ELT, right? There's that functional group level, which we would call product marketing and, and IT. And then that ELT level, that's the, you know, the goalkeeper for all of this at the broadest level. Yeah. Um, so I often like find myself sitting in a room across, you know, marketing, IT or product management. And the number one thing that I see that is leading to problems is subjectivity and what's measured and what are you measuring, right? There's a lot of organizations that rely on vanity metrics. So shifting towards um, an actionable uh, framework for your analytics and having consist consensus across all of your different departments is really the number one way I've seen to get everybody on the same page um, and driving towards the same direction. Because you know, all those all those disparate teams were are are really much more powerful together if they're rowing the same boat towards the same goal as opposed to being in three different boats rowing towards something des desperately. So that that's the one thing for me that really stands out. Yep, that makes a ton of sense. I think, you know, Jonathan asked a great question around, are you seeing media companies growth retention curves change post COVID where subscriptions are in the mix? If, I would say that, for, oh yeah, Tim, go I was going to say, but I'm going to try and share my screen real quick. Can you, can you see this? You can, yeah. Okay. This, this chart is not on retention, but the reason why I'm bringing this up is I do an iOS rankings report that I've been tracking for a long time. And this particular one you're looking at is streaming wars, but it's not retention, but I... Could you zoom in a little bit? It's super tiny on our side. We get to maximize your screen. Oh, yeah. You know that makes sense. If you maximize okay, your screen, here we you go. can see it. That but what this is showing is the differences in businesses that had digital-first subscription operations versus Cinemark and AMC who did not. And you can just see the differences in activity reflected in their iOS app rankings. I mean, it's just, it's just dramatic here. So I think... Having subscription, being digital first, showing up on, you know, Apple TV or Fire Stick is is the key in terms of driving engagement for media first companies. Personally speaking, I don't even like to watch TV anymore. I would I would prefer to only be on Fire TV or Netflix 100% of the time because I just can't stand the ads. 
And what I would say broadly here too is we're seeing a shift in business model. So if we go back to the very beginning of media companies, it was a place where you paid for access to content that was delivered. And, and so like this is early stage New York Times, early stage Bloomberg and other major periodicals that started the media sensation of uh, what we might call news. Now, media is much broader now and we're all in the mixed content game. So it's kind of complicated, but I think there has to be a return to the roots where you're emphasizing continual revenue from a subscription base and catering content to that subscription base rather than generating mass clickbait to try to get some eyes that you sell ad dollars against that result in impressions. And, you know, that's this, the story of BuzzFeed versus others, right? The, the rise and fall of BuzzFeed was they focused very heavily on acquisition and engagement in the short term with limited focus on retention. The firms that are gonna have that long legacy they can draw upon that will drive those retention curves are those who are like the economist who write for the readers that pay rather than writing for the general population to pull them on the platform to sell ads against them. So a, a complicated ecosystem here, but start of a dialogue there. How, oh, print media, perfect, okay. A Little bit deeper on how MoneyGram was able to drive more retention and re-engagement. So yeah, I mean, I think what I would talk about here is more than anything, they started by creating a platform that was fundamentally different than what they started with. It used to be a physically dominated business. They were able to offer a lot of those services digitally. What that did was that opened up more channels than they were ever able to utilize. And they started to plug the loyalty program in as the kind of master data source, using loyalty program as the starting point and driving second transaction, third transaction, fourth transaction. The focus here more than anything is back to what we had talked about before, which is the adjacent user theory. How can we get somebody who historically sent money on the first and the 15th of every month how can we get customers that looked very close to that customer before they started sending money on the 1st and the 15th to that level? How can we get customers who have only ever made one transaction, have them two transactions on platform? It's incremental gains rather than trying to accelerate someone from the very start of the funnel to the very end of the funnel. We would advocate pull a chunk of users from that second step of the funnel, the third step of the funnel is a much bigger win than pulling one user from the very beginning of the funnel to the very end of the funnel. Don't know if you wanna talk any more about that, Tony, from like a user side, how do you message to drive engagement and retention? What are some of the things that you consider on that? Well, side? you know, to me, it all boils down to, in a situation like MoneyGram, for example, if it is a meaningful utility that makes me feel like I've got some sort of superpower or helps me in my day-to-day -day life without interfering or without annoying me, you've won. So those people that, like you said, going from two to three instead of one to five, if those from two to three are just diehard because it has essentially made their life easier, that's a total, total win. It's a meaningful, intentional utility and it's not fluff. Again, like, like I said, kind of at the very beginning, it has earned a spot in the real estate on my device. So we're right at time. Tim, is there one thing that you would give to the audience if you were thinking about a change that you would advocate in a post-mobile growth, post-COVID period to drive mobile growth or growth in general of digital properties? What advice the two would biggest that be? things that I dig in on when it comes to growth in a post COVID-19 world are going to be having a really core engagement loop that is cross channel in nature. And what I mean by that is you have you have campaigns that go out via SMS, go out via email, do push uh, do push notifications, you know, um, in a timely manner that are personalized. So that's the first thing uh, to increase engagement through engagement loops. And then secondly, having a habit forming feature in your application. Because your, 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 your app or your, your web app, your mobile app, or however you deliver it is becoming the main place where consumers engage in your, in your business ecosystem. And so having something in that experience that they can come to that isn't the buy action that gives them a, 
the ability to come to your experience and, and be there to experience without having to buy something, I think is really important. And it's something that as a business, you can drive massive engagement off of that and increase the chances of converting those users as longtime customers. Totally makes sense. Can you give us one example of a habitual loop that you have um, my been a part of lately? My habitual loop is with Credit Karma. So Credit Karma has an experience where they have an habitual loop and a habit forming feature. So whenever you sign up for Credit Karma as an app, um, and in my experience, uh, somebody told me about it because I saw them at work and they were just checking their phone with their credit score. So I signed up based upon a referral. I got started. It was free to get going and I got my credit score immediately. So I didn't have to pay anything to start getting this value, right? And so that's the habit forming feature that I'm talking about is this, this value you get from a business over time without having, having to give anything from an effort or a cost standpoint. Now, what happened is as I checked my, as I checked my credit score, I was also seeing these offers for new credit cards, you know, for, for new financial products. And that's where Credit Karma makes their money is on the referrals from these financial products. And lo and behold, eventually I signed up for one, which was a Southwest card. And then eventually I got those bonus points that came with the card for signing up. And I went and told one of my friends. So they not only have an engagement loop and a, and a habit forming feature, but they also have, you know, the ability to drive word of mouth on the back end, which is really your biggest driver of new organic users. Retain users, drive new organic users. So, yeah. I love that. We should print that into a t-shirt. Tony, what about you? First what of all, Tim, thing I did the exact same thing with Credit Karma. Um, <laughs> I would say, from my perspective, <laughs> it's about empathy and driving organizational and experience innovation because you're listening, not because you want to be cool. And that's where, because because people can sniff that out, where it just becomes innovation for the sake of it instead of you're listening to me and you're thinking ahead for me and you're serving me. And that's, uh, that's, how, that's what I would leave you with. I will leave you with a different one, which is, it's important to work on your business, not in your business. What I mean by that is in a post COVID world, a lot of y'all out there, including us, our hours are crazy. We're adopting to a new norm. We're working remote. A lot is changing. There's huge fluxes in funding and expectations. And it becomes really easy to fall into the trap of the urgency of now. If you really wanna drive substantive growth, on the platforms that you manage, sometimes you're gonna to have to have conversations with your colleagues that have no goals. Just purely networking, just to be empathetic, just to understand their point of view. Because if you can join your team together and you can drive team level morale, the amount of growth you'll be able to unlock is incredible. And I'll give you one really simple example. We were working with a client that IT created a dashboard on the campaign Marketing created all the content for what the engagement campaign was going to be. They used that, you know, any data that they thought was relevant from marketing's point of view, which was not the data that IT prepared. They sent it out to the marketplace. IT made sure that that engagement campaign executed. IT took a report of what was going on and sent it back to marketing. Well, we found out no one at marketing had ever read that email that IT sent about how the campaign formed and how the campaign functioned when it was in the marketplace. You'd be surprised at how common it is that there's a lack of alignment on goals, functions, roles and responsibilities and expectations at all levels of the organization because we have different leaders, we have different metrics that we're managing to at a BU level, and we're now being asked to work cross-functionally. And working cross-functionally is extremely difficult. Now you do have some organizations that are realizing this and they're putting chief experience officers, chief digital officers, they're changing the entire structure and motivations of the business units that are responsible for acquiring, converting, engaging, and retaining digital users. However, not every organization is like that, and you might not be working in an organization like that. So the, the quick thing to do is spend time working not 
in the business, but on the business. Create some time to talk with your colleagues. Destroy that myth that everything is urgent and start actually hearing what their goals are and see if you can jointly align all of the requisite goals towards a goal that will ultimately drive growth. And if not, always a good time to escalate that conversation because we know that the executive leadership team is more concerned than ever on those random weird metrics that they never thought were that important because digital was only 5% of our business, but now it's everything. Okay, so uh, that's what we got here. I know we're a little bit late. Normally our mics would have been turned off, but I don't think they can do that in this environment. So I assume that we all just leave, but before we do that, we weren't able to get through everything today. If you have any questions for us, if you wanna have a conversation, you can reach out to any of the three of us on LinkedIn. You can shoot us a note via our website, which is bottlerocketstudios.com. We're happy to have a conversation there. Uh, this is hard. This is hard for everybody right now for a variety of reasons. Uh, and know that there's a huge ecosystem of partners out there that are ready to support the growth that you seek. All you gotta do is start that conversation. So we're here to do that. We're happy to talk about it. No expectations, as we like to say, for free and for fun. Uh, we're always curious to learn ourselves because it gives us a lot better ability to consult and inform our clients about what's working and not working out there. Okay, so see you all. And I guess I'll just leave this session and we'll Thanks end so it out. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us.